Oh, okay, so yeah, this one uh, uh, is fine. So I, I wonder if the so you said that the set of I suppose those are the uh, stabi stabilizers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those represent uh, basically uh, an operation applied to a state. Yeah. So the axes yeah. are our operators. Okay, so my question is, is if this representation is unique somehow. Uh, so, so uh, yes, uh, I didn't explicitly, I, I alluded to it, but I didn't explicitly say it, but uh, mm -hmm. so we can, so if with respect to a given state, right? So for example, this one, we mm -hmm. can talk about all of the, all of the operations that stabilize that state. And that mm -hmm. that set of operations is actually a group, and, and, mm -hmm. and because uh, because the operations are 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 they they're they're closed under composition, right? So so you you can't get out of the group. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, given that is given that they, they satisfy a group structure, we can talk about the generators of that group, which is the okay. which is the set of operations that suffice that suffice to generate all of the stabilizers in the set. Mm -hmm. And so this one that I gave here is is not just any old group of stabilizers. It's the generator for the group of stabilizers of that state. Okay. So and that do sense, they? And that's it's, it's a minimal set. It's so unique in that set. In that. Yeah. Sense. And in, do they stabilize only one set, like just one state? Yes. Well, I mean, yeah. Yes. In that. So these this is these are the stabilizers for. Uh, this is a stabilizer representation of that state. Okay, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, uh, Vincenzo, uh, your question. Okay. And might I ask Patricia to... Because... It's possible to hear me, yes? I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. This uh, lectures, uh, the lecture has been uh, wonderful. I have uh, two very small observations. One is... Uh, uh, you argued in a so clear way for your thesis that I cannot understand how it's possible that Jos and Linden <laughs> maintain a different point of view <laughs> on this topic. <laughs> I would like to understand which are, since I, I never write this paper by them, I, I, I would like to understand that how it's possible to maintain a different point of view from, from your, it is so clear from a philosophical point of view perspective. Second point, uh, um, wh why why this this uh, this uh, set of uh, of gates uh, is uh, named uh, Clifford uh, Clifford group because it's uh, similar to complex numbers from an algebraic point of view. There is a, a something similar with quaternions or with other classical example of uh, non commutative algebra. It is only an historical uh, point. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that very complimentary description. <laughs> uh, so the, the the second question first, uh, the short answer is that unfortunately I don't know. Actually, I think I think I remember learning that once, but I have sadly forgotten why they why the, it has that name. Uh, I think I'm pretty sure that uh, it's related to uh, to whatever uh, to the, the things to the things that you that that you were mentioning. But I, I I can't say that for certain. So unfortunately, I don't know. But if somebody somebody does know, then I'd uh, okay. have to say. Um, um, as for the first question, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I clearly, I clearly, I agree. Uh, in fairness to Yosha and Linden, um, I mean, it's a long paragraph. It's true, but it's the only part of that paper we kind of finish it. I would say, and I think they're just they're just confused. Um, I one thing I want to mention is that in that same, if I, I believe it's the same paper. Yeah, it's in that same paper where they actually prove. I think as I, as I kind of mentioned that in the standard formalism, entanglement is actually necessary for for uh, for quantum speed up. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I mean, it's like it's. 
I, I didn't. I don't mean to pick on them too much. So like, so like, I presented that quote, and I just kind of said that I don't think we should be going this direction. We should we should think try to think about it in a in a different uh, direction. And I kind of left it standing without really you know picking on them more than that. But yeah, I mean, I've I honestly don't have an answer to to to. I mean, I think I understand what they're trying to say, and I just think it's confused. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't have I don't have more of an answer to give. I'm sorry. Um, I think well, I'm, I'm not sure if Caesar has a follow up. Uh, I see he wrote uh, something in the chat. So, if Patrick, if you want to, who uh, Fraser? He 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 wrote sorry, I, the audio is breaking Hello. up. Oh. Yeah, I, I was just following up Hello. about the um, the question about Clifford algebras and and why you might refer to them in that way because there's a nice isomorphism between quaternions and poly matrices, so that's just where the where the term comes from. Oh, man. thanks. Yes, Thank uh, I read that in the in the in the chat. Thanks. Yes, and we also have a question from. So on you go. Mirko, I cannot hear you. Yeah, uh, I said, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. So now, I, yes. I said uh, Patricia had a question, so now she can ask. Oh, sorry, yeah, I didn't hear you either. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just wondering, so the Baltusman Neil set of gates seem like a quite like cute and quaint set of gates, but what are they actually useful for? So why, how are they and what computations can we do with them? Or a different version of the same question, why did they choose, why did the uh, authors of the theorem choose those set of gates just because they could prove stuff about them? Or are they actually useful for something? Uh, no, they're extremely useful. So. Um... So I did. I I wanted to mention this, but I forgot to. But so like so one one, so where, where the stabilizer formalism comes from in particular is error correction. Mm-hmm. So an error. Cor- so we we implement error correction in quantum computing by using the stabilizer formalism, and so that's where that's where that that's where that's coming from, and so and so by reflecting on this, people you know people have have talked about. It. So they've noticed that, that that using the stabilizer formalism. We seem to get more efficient uh, descriptions of, of systems, and so that so that's one sense in which it's useful. Another sense in which it's useful. Uh, so I alluded to it. Uh, I alluded to it earlier. Uh, I think I just mentioned it. Uh, like like uh, yeah, I just mentioned it as an aside that uh, you can implement the teleportation algorithm, for instance, with uh, with uh, with the Clifford group of gates, right? And um, Generally, it's useful. The Clifford group is not a universal set. Which is what we saw, we saw that uh, yesterday. So it's not a uni- universal set, but it can. It, it, there's a lot that you can do with it. And one thing in particular you can do is like it's hard. It may be hard to generalize. Uh, it may be hard to to generate an entangled system in one go, right? With one operation, you might want to do it piecemeal by by running a Hadamard and a control knot. Right? So that's a standard way of generating an entangled system. For instance. So the Clifford group, are, these are, are used all the time. In fact, they're, they're maybe the most important. Uh, well, not from, a, not, from an, 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 not from the point of view of enabling quantum speed up, but from the point of view of which gates are actually used in, uh, in the circuit model of computation, the Clifford gates are extremely important. They're maybe the most important gates. OK, yeah, so I guess it is. So while they enable a lot, if you're trying to prove quantum speed up, then you'd better get yourself out of that group. Exactly. Even stated here, right? I I see that. Oh, thanks. Thank you. And now uh, we have two clarificatory questions from uh, Clarissa. On you go. Uh, Hi, uh, thanks, Michael, for the talk. I'm not going to turn on my video because I'm worried about my internet connection. Um, I think he's actually answered uh, that. Uh, in relation to Patricia's question. I guess I just want to go back to some of the earlier slides and maybe I didn't catch this as much and I'm actually comparing it to the um, the Aronson 
Gottsman paper that I kind of put out and I was scanning as, as I was uh, listening to the lecture as well. Um, there was some reference actually to classical simulation going on there. It seems to me, I haven't read the paper obviously, but is there, um, how do I put it, a way of actually attempting to simulate a quantum computational efficiency within a kind of like classical deterministic setting in terms of the GK um, theorem. And uh, yeah, th that was what I was actually thinking about, um, you know, especially when we talk about uh, how it's used actually for proving the, the Brown state inequalities. So that is one clarification uh, I'm trying to get because one of the preliminary um, extra of the paper by uh, God, Aronson and Gottsman was that he actually talks a bit about how, um, you know, so, I mean, chemists and do not want to wait for a, a ready quantum computer to be built and therefore, you know, they're actually using sim quantum simulators on classical computers. So I'm just wondering whether this is an attempt to um, find a kind of like a uh, equilibrium or I don't know what's best way to say equivalence right between a classical I mean between quantum computation in a classical setting and the GK option is the best way to go about doing that so that's one and secondly um, I actually want to connect this back to a bigger question I'm not sure whether it's appropriate to do so because I was thinking also about the church Turing uh, definition of the universal computer and I'm wondering if the GK theorem itself comes closest among all the other existing algorithms for thinking about, you know, the the finiteness, the finite dimension dimensionality of a universal uh, quantum computer and and the decomposable part. Because I, I noted a slide that talked a bit about the um, how I think it was the Alice and Bob example where you know you can look at all the it was a thought experiment I think on how you can actually uh, break down the individual communication and uh, from the combination total uh, communication that was going on in there. So yeah, I'm I'm trying to think whether this itself is an allusion to the composability or am I stretching this a little bit too thin? Yeah. So these are my two questions. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure I completely understand. But, uh, let me let me say something. Let, let me know if I'm let me know if I'm getting close to answering your question or if I'm getting further away. Okay. Uh, sure. So um, so I'm, I don't I I don't recall I, I don't know the paper you're referring to at the top of my head. Um, by Aronson and Gottsman. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm may, I may know, but I can't, I can't recall what it is based on your description. Yeah. But um, so, in in one sense, so like, I mean, I haven't been keeping up to date with the, how exactly the latest machines by IBM and Google and so on work. Um, but. At one point, there was a criticism of, I think it was a, a, a D-Wave machine. Uh, one of the mm -hmm. D-Wave yeah. machines that uh, it was claimed. So it was uh, kind of an example. Of the excuse experiment. me, just just a, a little detail. Uh, Clarissa, could you turn off the microphone while Michael is answering? Other, oh, yeah, great. Otherwise, we have it in the eco. So, um, right, so there was... If I remember right, there was a question about this with relation to the uh, with to the uh, to the D-Wave computer, and so it was it's it's claimed by D-Wave uh, that their computer was a quantum computer, and and the situation is analogous to the thought experiment, as you put it, that I mentioned with Alice and Bob in Bob's office, and so D-Wave had this uh, had this device that they called a quantum computer, uh, well has this device, and and uh, and. Uh, And but uh, be, for proprietary reasons, I believe uh, like talk like like refer to it like a few years ago when you were talking about it. They 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 mentioned that actually the things the, the kind of things that that quantum computer is doing 
are the kind of things that can be efficiently simulated classically. I.e., they're the kind of things that don't that don't leave the Clifford group of operations, right? And so I don't know if if their quantum computer has progressed uh, since then. I'm not sure. I haven't kept up with 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 that aspect of the technology, um, but certainly. So if you if if you want to just show that a quantum computer, if you want to say like I want to be able to build a computer using quantum mechanical systems, right? I mean, in in a in a I mean, every, obviously everything is using quantum mechanical systems, but in a, in a way that takes advantage of quantum mechanical resources. If I want, and maybe I'll start with the operations that are easily that are more easy to implement. And that's fine, but that doesn't that it, it doesn't follow from that that you have a computer that can actually outperform a classical computer because you haven't you haven't left the gospel uh, you haven't left uh, the you haven't, you haven't done anything that the null theorem says that a classical computer can't do, right? And so while it's useful to to build a computer uh, in that way for those purposes, if you want to actually have a quantum computer that does what it's been advertised to do, which is outperform classical computation in certain contexts, then you have to go outside of the gospel set. Um, and so on the one hand, the, the, the statistics that are generable on the basis of a series of gospel nil operations can be used as, as, uh, as a way to, to judge whether, to, to judge like like to, to have to give a healthy dose of skepticism to, to some of these some of the claims that are made about about whether somebody has built or not built a quantum computer so it's it's a it's a it's a criteria with which to 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 distinguish you know when a quantum computation is actually done but it's been advertised to do um i didn't quite understand the point you're making about the church turing thesis so but but i hope i answered part of the of, of your of the questions you're asking Okay, great. Yeah, that, um, yeah. that's fine. Uh, the Turing thing was just a conjecture on my part, so it's not really that uh, important to answer. I was just trying to connect uh, what was discussed in terms of the thesis in relation to what you were discussing about the GK theorem. Thank you. What, what, we'll talk. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, about the, the Church Turing thesis in the next in the next presentation. So, uh, if there are no other questions, oh, wait, there are, I think I've skipped some. Uh, I have Rich, Richard, he has a question now. Hi, uh, can you hear me? My internet is falling apart at the moment. Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to ask, and there may not be a, a decent answer to this, it's very open. Um, if Michael has any thoughts on um, yeah, I can hear the you. hydrodynamic simulations of quantum effects and their importance or not uh, in terms of local hidden variables and things in that direction. Oh, so do you mean the, um, uh, the oil droplet experiment and so on? Uh, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so along the same lines as this, so I don't know. I don't know the. So like, I, I've read a little bit of that literature, but I don't. Uh, I can't claim to be an expert or or be a specialist on 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 those uh, on those simulations. Um, the. So, but I'll I'll relate the I'll relate the the small subset of that uh, that I do know about, and uh, uh, so those. So the, the the simulations that you're referring to, believe that I do know about, are those that 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 seem to show uh, an analogous model to the De Broglie Bohm model, uh, to, to the De Broglie to the Broglie to the to the De Broglie Bohm uh, uh, hidden variables theory of quantum mechanics, right? And so these these hydrodynamical simulations purport to show they show a kind of an underlying classical model of wave particle duality, and uh, so my own take, at, like not having thought extremely deeply about this, but my own take is that 
the lesson there is kind of similar to the lesson I, I was giving here, is, right, is, is that given that you can give a classical model, it shows that the effects that you're simulating there aren't really Bana, aren't really, you know, like the, 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 state, the, the distinguishing features of quantum systems. You know, like, the, like you aren't really capturing something distinct about quantum mechanics when you do that. And so in a way you can kind of rule out wave particle duality off your list of things that distinguish quantum from classical theory. So that's the take home message for me, right? And it's kind of, kind of similar to the take home message of this talk, I think. But again, I'm not a specialist okay. on that literature, so, so I qualify that claim. No, I, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on the matter. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, thank you. And now we have some more questions. I don't know the, the name because it's reported as double B. So uh, double B is your turn. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. I, for, I forgot to change the account. It's Christian Mariani. Okay. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, so thanks, thanks a lot for the talk. I, I, I understood way many things than when I read the paper. I have two very small uh, questions. Um, one is about, uh, probably I just misunderstood something, it's about the relation between um, your uh, toy model, the, the, the one you've been discussing today, and the one from Kent, the collapse loophole. Um, mm -hmm. So very naively, um, I was under the impression that, uh, well, let, let's put it that way. It's not totally clear to me how you can talk about collapse, uh, what it means to talk about collapse within a, an hidden variable theory, but that just means probably I missed something from the talk. I used to, you know, sure. categorize those theories as uh, without collapse, but maybe because you're talking at a different level of, uh, of, okay. of, of the theory. And the other one is uh, even more silly this, than this one, and it's about uh, what you mean by this practical context that you introduced today. And I was initially, when I read the paper, under the impression that you wanted to uh, specify this practical context as, as something um, in, as in, in principle, in, in possibility to achieve certain, uh, to, 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 to achieve certain results or to, to, to have answer to certain questions we might ask. Uh, today, uh, I rather understood it as something that might change with time. Maybe we can, we, the practical context can be extended depending on uh, the, the tools we have. Uh, which reading is the, is the correct one? And in, if it's the first one, if you believe there is some analogy also with the, what Deutsch says in the constructor theory when he talks about um, the, uh, the general framework of quantum theory as a way to provide uh, questions about what is possible and impossible to ask about uh, physical systems. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. Uh, so let me start with the, uh, the, Kent, uh, the relation to uh, Kent. Uh, so Kent's uh, theory is called causal quantum theory. And so the idea there is, so it's a superficial similarity, but, but there is a similarity. So the idea there is that um, in Kent's model, uh, so when you consider how a quantum system collapses, how the state vector for a quantum system collapses, what you need to do is you need to take into, a, you need to take into account all of the previous collapses that have occurred in the past light cone of that system. And so in that sense, it's superficially similar to the model I gave where you have the combined measurement event and, and, and signaling that happens between. Because in the same way as in, as in, uh, as in Kent's model, given, so, 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 so the, the idea is like, so imagine that you have, you have two wings of an apparatus, right? And, and then, I, and then I, uh, I do an experiment, Alice does an experiment on one wing and Bob does an experiment in the other way. And so according to quantum theory, you think that the values of those measurements have been realized at space-like separation, right? That's what quantum mechanics will tell you. So what Kent's collapse locality, uh, collapse, no, sorry, what uh, Kent's causal quantum theory tells you is that actually you don't, you shouldn't be thinking in that way. What you should be thinking of, so Bob's, collapse is affected 
by Alice's collapse, when it becomes the case that she's that that, that you know that she she be, she ends up being in in his past life coma, if like if they evolve in such a way that 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 is able to to occur, right? So, in that sense, we don't know when Alice's value takes Alice's measurement takes the value that it does, right? And that and that the same thing happens in my uh, in my uh, my conspiratorial model, is that we don't know when uh, when Bob's Bob's bit, uh, so when when Alice or when Alice's bit takes the value that it does, because it could there could be signaling at any point previous to the combined measurement event that would cause the value to switch, and so it's the same. So in, 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 superficially, it's the same idea, right? It's that it's that the, it's the fact that it's that we all we only take a, we we take account of things that are in the past in the past light cone that are time like separated. We don't consider things that are space like separated as affecting as affecting the collapse. And so, in that superficial sense, they're similar. I don't want to claim that they're more similar, you know, more similar than that. But so, like, there's a, there's an analogy there. Um, so, with regards to the practical context, so no, it's not an in principle claim. Um, it's a it's a it's 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 essentially a complexity theoretic claim, and the claim is going to break apart, right? So, like, it's a it's a it's a theoretical claim. Uh, and it's it's a it's it's a judgment. So like basically the idea is, if we're in the theoretical context, and you give me a candidate uh, a local hidden variables theory, before I go out and test whether it's a good one or not, I, I even before that make a judgment implicitly whether I should whether it's even worth spending my, my research money to test it. And si similar thing happens in the practical context, right? So if you give me a candidate explanation for how this D-Wave machine is, is working on my desktop, uh, well, not on my desktop, <laughs> in, in, in that building over there across the street, then it better be a plausible description, right? And now plausible is a loose concept, right? So, so informally speaking, plausible is a very, is a very it's, a, it's, a very, it's a vague term, right? And so how do we actually make those judgments in practice? Well, we make those judgments by appealing to our scientific theories. And there is a scientific theory that tells us what's plausible and implausible in, in that context, and that's com uh, computational complexity theory. So we appeal to computational complexity theory to tell it to make the help us with those judgments. Of course, even then, you know, like, these, like I'm going to be talking about this more uh, this afternoon. Um, but even in that case, you know, these complexity theoretical concepts are not are not set. I mean, they are set in stone, but they don't necessarily, they're not always useful in every case. Essentially, we always have to make a judgment about whether to apply them or not. You know, there's always, a, there's, always a, there's always a sense in which our theoretical concepts don't map onto the world, right? But for many purposes, for many, for many, uh, for many, for many situations of interest, it's going to be very useful and it's, it's going to be a, a good general rule for distinguishing plausible from implausible tasks to use Deutsch's terminology, to use a Deutsch terminology, by using uh, things like complexity theory or related disciplines. And so whether these things are absolutely fixed for all time, well, yes and no. Um, I mean, so a particular algorithm we might discover tomorrow that actually it's it's sufficiently solvable classically even though we didn't think it was before so maybe tomorrow we discover that factoring maybe we give an efficient algorithm for factoring tomorrow and in that case our judgments about what's going to be achievable in practice are going to be different so in that sense they will change depending on what we learn about 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 the complexity theoretic structure right? but they're fixed in the sense that in the sense that, in, in in the sense that they're given externally by a particular science, by comp by computational complexity theory. So in that sense, they're fixed because they're external. But of course, scientific theories evolve, and so they're not fixed absolutely for all time. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, we can start the break now, and uh, we'll meet all back here at half past five. And as always, remember to post your photographs of your coffees or teas in the Slack platform. And see you all later. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.